If you're not in there marketing, someone else is. Business of Architecture, episode 297. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm your host, Enoch Sears, and this is the show where we discover and talk about and discuss designing the design firm. Today, we're going to have a conversation with Peter Kenley. Peter is a business development marketing professional, past president of the Society for Marketing Professional Services, SMPS. In addition, he's worked over 30 years in business development and marketing positions for four ENR top 500 design firms, including two well-known architectural firms, NBBJ and Moody Nolan. So today we're going to talk about everything from how to form those new relationships with potential contacts, how to grow your network, how to do business development, even if you're a busy design firm owner and you barely have time to get stuff done every day because you're running from deadline to deadline. And he's going to give us some tips for actually winning those interviews, even when you have stiff competition by doing your research ahead of time. He's going to give some stories about how he's been able to do that. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to go check out a special link, freearchitectgift.com, where you'll be able to get access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video. Now, that video doesn't deal only with profit. That's just one of the pillars of having a dream practice. The others are fulfillment, freedom, things that give you satisfaction, being able to do high quality work for high quality clients and and strategies for being able to achieve that are outlined in that special video that I prepared specifically for podcast listeners. You can get access to that by going to freearchitectgift.com and your email address in there. You'll get on my email list and you'll also get my sometimes infrequent or frequent updates. I usually send out a weekly email to my subscriber database just with the latest tips and techniques and things I'm seeing on the front lines of helping firms and architecture firm owners grow their practices smartly and sustainably. So with that, let's jump into today's interview with Peter Kenley. Without further ado, here is today's show. Pete, hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture show. Hi, Nick. Happy to be here. So great to be with you. And you're someone that brings a, a vast array of stories and experience in the marketing and business development and sales. We're going to get into all of that today. What, I'm, what I'd like to share with our audience is how originally did you get involved in the AEC industry? Uh, it was really by accident, which a lot of us are. Uh, I was working for the state of Ohio, just in administrative capacity, and they had a major construction program coming up and they put out... Uh, requests for applications to be submitted. I put mine in and I won because they liked my business ethics. Uh, I had lots of business training. I had my degree already and they wanted somebody to do budgets and keep things on schedule. And that's what I was good at. So I was pulled right in. I really had no experience. And the people in the office, the architects and the engineers and the others trained me and uh, then I, when I went in the field for construction projects, the field people trained me on what was what and how it was done. So I learned totally that way. And uh, and, and then uh, uh, when I when I finished there, I said, "Well, I got I want to go out on my own and you know go to work for architects and engineers," and put out. And one of the top engineering firms in town hired me. And really, I learned from the ground up. I wrote the proposals. I went out to see the clients. I saw existing clients. I went to see new clients. And I think that's another thing is that, you know, what we did back then, uh, marketing and business development were synonymous and sales, all synonymous, but they're very different things. And most of us that do speaking around the country, we, we, that's the first thing we hit, what's marketing and what's sales and, uh, and business development. And why don't you clarify those three for us? Okay. Marketing is the things you do to sell. Okay. All the prep, looking up stuff, selling proposals and everything doing proposals and then selling is actually like the interview situation or if someone is out there business development out there so you got a business development guy sitting across the desk from somebody that's selling and, or an interview situation that's when you're selling so you got to remember so everything leading up to get into that interview or to get that job is what the marketing people do and then the business development and the project manager and other they win the job and a lot of times there are there it's hard for architecture firms to find people who are really skilled at marketing. Most of them are marketing coordinators, they're graphic designers, glorified graphic designers. No offense to any of you who are listening who have that position, but sometimes they lack the understanding of what it really takes to persuade, what it really takes to start a conversation, to get interest, things like that. What have you seen to be successful in terms of that kind of position? Well, I think you're right. And even in, you know, somebody comes in marketing, they may be uh, in PR 
because they knew PR or knew how to write, and that's it. They really don't know anything about buildings or anything else. I've trained a lot of my own people, and I think a lot of people do that. And part of the thing is if you hire someone who's already been out there, they have a lot of bad things they bring a lot of times. So I'd rather train them in my own image and likeness and, and what, I, what I know and how to do. But it just takes a long time. You've got to be observant. You've got to watch. And you've got to ask questions. And, you know, if you don't ask questions, you're not going to learn. And that's what I did. I essentially was mentored by a whole bunch of people who took me under. I said, well, why do you do that? Or how do you do that? And they talked to me. And then eventually I got you know, enough knowledge that I could go and do things on my own. So I think it's a matter of, Knowing what you don't know. In other words, uh, you know, our areas in this business, we do six domains of practice. We call it marketing. And it's market research, market planning, proposals, business and client development, PR, and essentially a management. That should be six. But all those are areas. And when we get somebody who's certified as CPSM, as a certification or industry, you're tested on your knowledge of all six of those areas before you're approved. So th that in those six areas, and I always would ask, you know, when I go out and talk to people over the country, I say, well, what do you think about how, in this room? How, what would you say on the one to 10? Are you in uh, market research? How about in proposals? How about marketing plans? And then I get that. But most of the marketing people say they're good at proposals and planning, not much market research, not much, certainly not management. And a lot of them have PR because that's communication PR. So we've got people that have holes. You got to figure out where the holes are and then you got to train them. Pete, you're actually sitting in the office right now of an architecture firm. You were business development and marketing director there for a number of years. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Eight years. Yes. Yep. And when you're working at that firm, what are some of the, the key lessons, things you implemented, key takeaways uh, that helped you be successful in that position? Well, I think we were uh, became much more consistent, and uh, I put together a plan on, you know, who are we going to try to go after and how we're going to do it. Uh, I worked very closely with the top management and figure out what they want to do. It's not what I want to do; it's what do they want to do, and then I got to figure out how to put together things. We had a very small staff; they got a much larger staff now. We had persons on proposals. We brought in one person to do PR, and I helped with about everything. So it just was trying to get things going and started. And after a while, you know, because of my background in uh, hiring architects and engineers when I worked for the state, I kind of knew what to do for interviews. So I would put together with my boss how to do those interviews, and we would put together a tremendous thing that differentiated us from the others. Too many people uh, in interviews want to come and just sell, sell, sell. That's not it's it. You've got to figure out what they want, and then you've got to talk to them about how you can provide that. If you don't figure out what they want, you don't know how to provide it. So that's what's going to give them. And, and then on interviews, it's not a company that interviews, it's people. And so you got to understand each of those people on the interview committee. So we are very thorough in doing all that. But, you know, I, and I just use my skills in interviewing and talking with people and listening. We always talk about listening. And you really have to listen a lot to understand everything. So you, you talked about a couple of key points there. Number one, you talked uh -huh. about the idea of needing to understand exactly, not not pitching, you know, needing to understand what the client really wants, uncovering that, and then being able to uh, take what they want and offer them a solution that lines up with what they want. And you talked about your your skills, communicating with people, and like you said, listening. Now, do you have any examples that come to mind of times when you were able to create, you also mentioned differentiation, uh, sometime that you were able to come into a, a difficult situation and the strategy you used in that situation? Well, you know, as what I was saying, a lot of time what they want to do is not necessarily what they're looking for. Uh, I had a guy on my committee when we used to interview, he was a code authority, and he wanted to know if you'd worked with these codes that come under this project. So he was going to ask you those questions. So my thing was to you know, get your team together, figure out how we're going to do it, find out exactly what they want. Uh, uh, some places it's your turn almost, you know, uh, to get a job if they like you. But, you know, if you've worked with somebody, you have a much better chance to get the project. Uh, some clients, you know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, Clarity Report, which is done by Dell Tech, in the country, three clients make up 44% of an architect engineer's work. Three clients make up close to half. So, uh, and I give you, I want to give you an example. Uh, uh, 
put one that's just what you want. I, I don't have one that comes to mind. Don't hit me here in a little bit, but I just, it's all, I'm, 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 I'm going through the computer now to find out which one it was. Tell me a little bit more about what you'd like, and then I can, maybe I can pinpoint the one that would be best about you, what, what kind of story. You bet. Well, when we talk about differentiation, a lot of firms, you know, I've, I've sat on both, have the opportunity to sit on both sides of the table, which is pretty fun to see how architects come in and present their mm -hmm. firms. And, you know, honestly, sitting on that side of the table as the client from the client side, by the end of the day, your mind is just, it's numb. Every architect comes in, you're just thinking, man, I wish there was some differentiator here to help me at least remember one of these firms from the other one. Yeah, yeah. Well, what you have to do is you have to really study the other firms and know the other firms. Uh, maybe uh, one of the things that really kills firms is, uh, I had one one day that uh, there was a bad report on the street. It was in the paper about something they did. And their approach was to hope it didn't come up. And hope is not a strategy. <laughs> of course it came up. And they were just like deer in the headlights. They just didn't really work on answering it. But I think if you talk with enough people, you will understand what to do. Um, we had a major project here at, at Moody Nolan where I'm at. And uh, it was a hundred million dollars, big job. And uh, my boss says, I'm gonna go out and interview every person on the team, there were 12, 12 people. He went out and interviewed every one. And let's say for the parking consult, parking guy who was responsible for parking on the campus, they went and talked to him. What were his big concerns? Well, we're gonna build over here. We don't have room over here. So we, we took all that in. We had one guy who became the strategist or the guy that was responsible for that area. And then he studied up what the university was and then knew some answers of this guy. So we knew everybody on architects, engineers, uh, uh, on the university side, the people who were going to operate it and what they all wanted. And we wanted to make sure we gave each one something. So that's kind of the thing. You know, you really... Uh, you never can practice enough either. And I think what happens is, uh, well, Fred, Fred can't be here. He's out on the job site. That doesn't get it. You need the whole group together to be able to bounce questions off each other. And then I just read an article that'll be published in the Marketer Magazine next month on, on Q and A, it can lose the project for you. And one, one bad word or one misunderstanding and you can lose the project. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of one right now is uh, uh, if someone, it, you always need to have a head guy on the interviews who can filter all the questions through him, who knows who's best on your team to do those. And you ask the owner to address them all to you. And then he can take them if he wants or give them to somebody. But if, if, if that person uh, uh, is not ready to answer, you know, he'd have to do it himself. So you could say, uh, uh, anything you wanted, but you really have to know what the owner wants to do and, and how to answer. And in short, it's better. Two sentences. When someone asks a question, give them the answer. And if you go on long, into an area, you might, you might kill yourself. I mean, it can be you give them the wrong information that they don't like and you don't know what people do and don't like. So I think uh, just doing as much as you can, being prepared. Remember, we always used to talk about probably when we were younger, the old light bulb for the uh, slide projector. I think you probably remember those days. There's no light bulb for a computer, but you got to have backup. If something like the, the, everything goes off and you have a PowerPoint, have your 10 copies ready to go and give out. And we did that at one interview. They were so impressed that we were able to go ahead that the system couldn't work and just talk from there. But I think to be... You really got to understand what your others have. If you're a big firm, you know, we got more people to put on. If you're a small firm, we got hands-on control. And I just finished a project with one and they had, they can see each other, <laughs> you know, so their communication, they know exactly what each other's doing. And that's good. And a lot of the small firms feel like, well, I can never be like the big guy. Well, most of the small firm guys have worked for big guys. And if you can be confident and it's really, you know, how many people really work on a, on a project, Enoch, in an office? Four or five? I don't know. It's not like you need a 70-man office to do a job. So I think you just got to think about your other clients and what they're going to come in and say. And you can almost figure out what they're going to push. You know, we've done everything in the world in this industry. Well, you know, this has a little bit different snag on it. They want this, which is not the same as those others. If you can focus on that and not on the experience that they have, because a lot of times with experience, they think they're going to win the job. So I don't know if they just you know, run that, oh, we're going to win that. There's no way we're going to lose it, you know, and then they lose. So I think uh, those are just some of the cases. 
Pete, what do you think is the key to winning projects consistently? Just having that steady flow of projects come in the office. A lot of our listeners are their seller doers. They have smaller firms, small firm practitioners. For someone like that, when they're the principal and they're also in charge of bringing in the business, if they were, you know, so you were to sit down with one of them and, and lay out a framework for being able to consistently get work and not have to worry about those feast or famine cycles that architects have to deal with so often, what would be your answer? Uh, don't shock you. Um, have a plan. You know, I had an office, one of our offices one time, I did a one page plan. Every time I went down there, who are you going to see? I mean, what markets are you trying to go after? Who do you want to see? No one's going to call more than two people a week. So I, you got to really focus and not shotgun it and really understand the industry. Take the time to go to the healthcare conferences. Take the time to understand and talk with those people. Those people will talk to you about issues. The trouble is when there's a project, a lot of times they're not allowed to talk to you. But I think that's what you want to do. You want to, to, to not shotgun and really target and learn as much as you can. Now, I've changed the whole meaning of the word sales. I don't. You know, I so said we don't use this much for business development. I've changed it to help, H-E-L-P. That's it. All you're trying to do is help the owner. If you talk to him and what he needs you have, then you can help him. If what he needs you don't have, how about referring him to somebody? Have you ever had somebody refer you to somebody else that worked out for you? You talk about what position you become? Huge. So I always, you know, rather than just saying, you know, go over and, and some of the stores used to do that. Oh, we don't have uh, those type of spoons, but they have them over bases. Guess what respect they have for you. So I just tell people, you can't go after everything. Well, we got an architect. Architect can do anything. Sure he can. But how about the guy that's done this and know the issues about it? So I think to get too far and then don't hesitate to get somebody else who's a specialist you know, a lot of times there's a design architect and then there's the project architect and, you know, get a specialist if you need it. There's a, there's a bunch of them out there now. So I would say don't vary too much. And you only have so much time to do, you know, business development and marketing. So, you know, do it so you can do it. I um, you know, I've had companies where we put out three or 400 proposals a year. That's just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, a lot of the a lot of the principals don't think proposals are worthwhile. And we had one owner that wanted us to submit a proposal for something. And he said, well, one of the principals said, well, we don't want to get it. Just take one of the old proposals and dust it off and change a few things. I said, I'm never going to put out a proposal that I didn't put out to win, period. Because once they get a proposal like that, you're, you're looked at as in the forget it pile. But the other thing I can add is a real system, simple system I used to have was A, B, and C is what I learned in 1970s. You place your targets in A's and B's and C's. C's are if you ever get to them, you know. It'd be nice to do a job for them, but I don't know. We'll just we'll kind of watch it. B's are your guys that may have something and may have something, may have something right now. Your A's are your current clients. And you know what? We, we, we ignore our current clients is what we do. And we always said in marketing, if you're not in their marketing, someone else is. So I'll ask a project comes up and I, I'll ask the fellow did the last project two years ago. Well, are you keeping up with him? Yeah. Well, when was the last time you saw him? Well, a year and a half ago. I said, you're not keeping up with the past clients. No, you've got to keep up with those people. You know, only want me when I got a project. Well, there's things you can do to help him. So the next time it comes up, you'll be up there. But it's more like actual real sales in the world where you keep up with people instead of doing a project and they go away, you do another project and then they come back and they hire. You've got to do more consistent because people are used to that, you know, and just nothing else and say, hey, let's come by and stop for a cup of coffee. You got a chance? No, but, you know, come by Monday. I mean, people don't turn me down for that. Uh, so I, I would say keep up with your people. Don't shotgun and more is less is more. And because the, the, the time you have is, is stuck, it's a certain amount. And if you can put time in on 10 proposals, the same amount of time as you put on 20, the 10 are going to be much better. So it just, it's just, it's a numbers game. Your numbers have to be manageable. Got it. And in your early career, what were some of the, the early lessons you learned, maybe more specifically about how to win the kind of projects that your firm was going after? Uh, I think getting into people's head, you know, you'd say, well, wouldn't someone like this on this project? Well, yeah, but you go talk to the guy, he didn't care about that. 
So you've got to talk to what they care about as opposed, and even when they've got the, the RFP that says, you know, 10 points for this and five points for that. I mean, you got to do all those and answer those. Uh, one thing I should say about proposals too, never, if you have 10 questions on a proposal, when you get to three, say refer to one, you always answer every question because there's a certain amount of points on that. But uh, uh, yeah, I, th I think all that uh, makes a difference. Now, a lot of times in, especially in institutional work, government work, we have this very tightly controlled RFP process where the client wants to remove any advantage due to emotion, due to relationships necessarily. And, you know, kind of go down to this, this point system. And I know for architecture firms who are trying to compete in that arena, it can be very difficult or very frustrating for them because maybe they haven't done a project like this in the past several years, but they feel like they have the capabilities and they don't have access to the decision makers, at least not being able to approach them and actually talk to them. What's your advice for a firm that's facing this in, in their situation? There's always a way to get the decision makers. Uh, and as you say, in the public area, a lot of them say, okay, since your RFP is out now, you can't talk to anybody or you'll be disqualified. And that's pretty huge. So you've got to have your business development out there working out, out front. Uh, I was working on a project in North Carolina for a university. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, lawyers and the accountants are way behind in marketing of our business. They make them believe that, but they are. They're way behind us. I'm a, I'm a, uh, license, I'm a uh, certified uh, uh national speaker for the legal marketing association i don't know anything about law but they knew i was a big speaker in marketing so we've got to have give me that question again i got off on the tangent there what was it give me the little bit of intro into what you how to get to them okay the uh, university uh my lawyer friend i was teaching him how to market he was meeting me regularly and he was director of marketing for a large law firm he knew nothing about it and so i was helping him i called him i said hey the the, the university over there, I think it was East Carolina University, I said, do you know the people, I looked and saw you're their, uh, art, their, you're their attorney, he says, oh yeah, I know that president. You want me to call him and have him tell you to you know, give you the good eye and, and, and hire you? I said, no, <laughs> I don't want you to do that. I want you to call him and say, you know, uh, this firm is gonna be in that interview and he's a good friend of mine, they're a good firm. That's all you gotta say to the president. And a lot of times the word are filtered down, but you can't do anything real obvious, but there's always a way to get to somebody. Uh, HR, HR people, they like to talk. And if you can do something for an HR guy, hey, if you've got a word, could you talk to the facility guy over there and tell him I'm gonna give him a call? So there's a way to get around all that stuff, but you have to somehow have contact from the inside or you, you're just, you know, and then what have they done lately? Well, if they had a big project overrun the last time, they're gonna be real concerned with that. And you might wanna hit that in your interview and say, you know, we, the last 10 projects, we've averaged 3% under the estimate on, at bid time. You know, something like that. And that's what's gonna hit hard. But you gotta, you know, what's their hot buttons right now? And if you don't know it, it's really hard to interview. If you got their hot buttons and when you say something that's right, they're gonna smile back. <laughs> you can tell right away that you have the right thing going. We, uh, for this one interview uh, that recently we got, I was working on six people on the committee and three were with the owners and three were the architect and engineers with the owner, okay, so it's six. We got done practicing our interview and came out to the end and I said, you know what? We never talked to the three owners people. So we spoke all architecture, engineering, construction. He says, you're right. We went back and redid the whole thing and they won the job. But it just, you've got you to gotta talk to the people that are there. But like you say, you got to get these points. And it looks, I worked for a government for eight years and it looks like it's real stringent and all that, but behind the scenes, it's not. You know, it's people, people give you a break, you know, they know what things going on, but you can't go directly against them. They say, don't call somebody, do not call. Them. One of the biggest challenges that small firm architects face, especially perhaps being introverts and, you know, preferring to do designs and architecture, not out there meeting new people, is how to create that first contact, how to grow the network. It's a little bit easier to follow up someone who you already know. However, what are some strategies that are some of your favorites for actually creating that first contact that first touch point yeah i think they have to know how to do it uh what i would do i'd have somebody tail with me okay there's a healthcare meeting here i said just come on with me i don't say hey read this book or do this just come with me and then i find something that's interesting uh your hair is kind of dark and grayish you know 
do you like the salt and pepper? You know, I like what you look in salt and pepper look, you know, I mean, find something out about somebody and talk to them. Uh, and I don't know, I don't want to be a gender thing, particularly women. I mean, you'd actually say something about, you know, a dress or something. And I like that combination, you know, and a lot of it, it's not like it's gender. It's like, Hey, that's nice for him to say that is what they usually do, but find something and just start a conversation and then get to the point where, you know, one of the things I do is this, do you guys do any of that? Are you involved? No, we don't do that. But you know, Fred over there does. I've had him point out people go over there and meet him. They're going to do a big project and you'd be surprised. But until the introverted person sees it work, you're not going to do it. You know, he, he needs to have it, but it's interesting because some of the recent information is introverts are sometimes the best salespeople. And why do you think that? Because they listen more than they talk. Listen. <laughs> yeah. And many architects and you're taught to be an, a speaker when you're an architect, but they listen and they know, but they, sometimes they're too direct. Are you going to do this project next week or not? You can't do that. But as far as, you know, uh, listening and then processing and ask and staying right within that head of that owner or that the person that's going to do a project, that's what you got to do. So I, I teach them how to do it. And I say, well, let's go to this conference or that conference. And uh, I probably exhibited, I'm sure you have it, hundreds of trade shows. When I do a trade show, I take a marketing person and a project person. Okay. They have a project answer, uh, answer needed that, but usually it's marketing answers. You know, that if you've done any of this, you've done that and you can answer that. And then you have one person, you stay in, one person stays there, you float around booth to booth. You know, we're looking for the healthcare people. If you say, Oh yeah, George over there. Perfect. You can get as much information from the other booths. People don't know that as other booths as anything else. So that's what I was always doing. But I taught, I teach people how to do trade shows it's not so much about what you show, it's how you get their attention. Uh, I had a trade show recently for my business with architects, and I took a picture of a guy on fire, his hair on fire. He says, is your hair on fire? All the time. Ours is too, and Mark, and then you start to talk about that. You know, How can we help you put your hair out on and you know, put water on it? So I think they just got to, you got to get somebody and, and then you got to you know, get enough information. But, but in a, uh, on a network, that you got to move quickly. If someone doesn't have what you want, hey, very nice to meet you. Thanks so much. Bye. Go on to the next one. But it, it takes a lot of time and effort to learn how to do that. And a lot of people, I had one architect one time, we were working at a room. And I said, you start over there and I'll start over here. And we came back and he had some really good things. He says, Pete, I hate doing this. <laughs> I said, I know you didn't go to school to do this. But he got great information. So, But we worked the whole room. But I, if people can figure out how to do it, give them a little process, show them, you know, talk about something that they're saying or doing, or if you hear something, something, uh, you know, and then there's all kinds of things. If you, two people are standing like this, it's hard to come in this way. So what happens, they're like this, they're open, you come right in. So there's all the, and there's all these books and information on this, which I've read a whole bunch, but when I do a presentation, I try to put those little things in there that will help them. But the, the less, the more you can show them what it is because they're not trained. You guys are not trained in how to, how to, uh, do a uh, work a room or network and then to follow up that's i don't have to tell you the follow-up is just so I'll, I'll call you back they never do well the follow-up is even more important than the original meeting you know uh, i said i'd call you this week and then you call you know, it's a follow-up but and if you don't do that do a letter or note and, and we talked hand notes thank you notes people don't do them uh, when i go to somebody's office i wrote somebody a hand note it's stuck up on their wall all the time it's a wonderful thing. People don't do them. So differentiate yourself, do hand notes. And the hand notes need to be right next to you on your desk. Or say, I'll write them a hand note. Never gets done. So, I mean, you got to have it right there. And what more could you do? I mean, I, it's just, and people love those. And a gimmick. I have a gimmick that I use. And people think it's funny. I've got a whole bunch of million dollar bills. And they look real from a guy out in Utah. And I put them in every, I was writing thank you notes today. Thanks a million for talking with me at the conference at a million dollar bill. You give a person a million dollar bill, you're going to watch them. They will. <laughs> you actually, you really gave them something. They cost me 20 cents a piece, but it's the best thing, you know, people just love them. So you got to have some gimmick or something that you have. And again, I'm differentiating myself. I just don't, you know, send a note back and say, you know, when you got work coming up or anything like that and hope to see you at the conference next year. So I think to be direct, but indirect. So 
through your people you know and others. You know. And uh, you can know, some psychologists say, or other people say, you can know about 200 people in this world who know you by first name. That's what the average is. But if you're good at it and work at it, you can know a lot more people by first name and they know you. And I was president of SNPS. I mean, there's just a lot of people I know. And the thing comes, which you probably know because you're doing all this, people know you and you don't know them. And they see you. And that's a little embarrassing sometimes. So you got to work on how to introduce yourself. But I, I just think that you can get around anything if you think about it. But people don't want to think about it. They, I called somebody seven times or I emailed them seven times. What well, do you think the eighth time going to help any? You know, <laughs> let's sit and talk. But for me as a marketing guy, let's sit and talk about how we might get to this person. I love these subjects. You can probably tell that. <laughs> yeah, Pete. And we were we were talking beforehand, and you were saying that a lot of what you teach is actually sales. Tell me about that. What's your perspective on what is sales, and what is it that you teach? Well, what I teach is trying to help people. You go in and you ask them what you need first to get an appointment. Is kind of difficult. Uh, you know, you got the gatekeeper out there. Uh, if you know the person's a gatekeeper, you take her a present. When you go see the big guy, I always take the big guy something and take her something. But uh, you, you've got to get past and get through to people. And it's very hard to get through to people. So you got to figure out where they go, what do they do, and how can you do that? Uh, give me some more about that one. I, that, I got off on the tangent there to talk about that. What was, what was it you were asking about that? Sure. So we were talking about this idea of sales, and you said that this is what you, oh. this is what you like to train on. Yeah. Find out what people want and then provide it to them. Uh, other words, uh, I went to a hospital and the, uh, director of the hospital facilities director, 15 hospitals she had under her. So I had 15 minutes. That's all she'd give me 15 minutes. So I talked to her and, uh, she said, you know, one thing I'm really interested in is, um, surgery suites. We're going to do a bunch of surgery suites and I don't know what the state of the art is. So I go back to my office and, you know, I don't know anything about surgery suites. I haven't been in medical stuff. And uh, I look up as much things as I can. I find one that really looks like it's a good one. Maybe it's about Cornell or somebody like that. Some good place, a well-known place. I send it to her. Now, it may give her something that she could use. But if it doesn't, it has given her uh, the knowledge that I'm going to work for her, you know, and, I, and I'm going to help her. So even if you don't do something, uh, it's, it's try to help them. So that's what I do. And then, uh, you know, the old thing about clothes, I was taught to close, you know, uh, do you want me to bring that product in here on Tuesday or Thursday? That was the old closing thing when I was doing sales of hot dogs. And you don't have that. What you have is you hopefully have a continuation of things that goes on. The average sale takes six contacts in the United States. Take all of them together. It takes six contacts. Uh, so what you've got to do is, is have a reason to come back, not just to see, you know, next time I'll bring some of that or I'll bring somebody with me that knows about those. And, oh, that's great. You know, if the person's getting something out of it, they'll continue to meet with you. If they're not getting anything out of it, if you're just pounding on them about how great your firm is, you're not getting anything. As long as you're helping them, they'll, they'll stick with you. So I think that's the key. And it's so interesting that years later, somebody might come up and say, you know, you helped me on that at one time. You know, I thought maybe you might be the person or offer yourself. I was thinking about this today. If you're an architect and you can't help them say, you know, if you ever get a, a cost estimate or something that you want somebody else just to look at, just give me a call. Just think about that. You know, I mean, that's that's stuff that they can't get. Awesome. And looking back uh, over just over our interview right here, what what's a question or, or topic that you wish I would have asked you about that that we didn't have a chance to cover? Uh, well, there's one I always think of the craziest interview we ever had, and it's a story. Do you, do you want me to tell you the story? Of, Let's go of the for interview? it. Okay. We were shortlisted for a university building, about 10 million. And uh, the interview was on this date. Okay. Now, usually I got those letters, the, the interview letters, but it went to the boss, and he got the wrong time. <laughs> the interview was at uh, three and he had four. So it comes time for the interview. We'd practice and done everything we should do. It comes time for the interview and we're not there. And they're sitting there waiting on us. So the uh, interview, Ed calls over, where are you? It's just 10 minutes away. Well, our interview's at four. No, it's not. It's at three. 
<laughs> my marketing coordinator brought the car around to the front. Everybody hopped in. They went over there as quickly as they could. And they didn't know where the interview was. And we're talking about a multi-building campus. So they went onto the campus and uh, we asked, uh, where's the interview? And all the interviews are over there. They sent them to a building where they were interviewing people for work. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, they found out the right place. And the biggest thing of all, our project manager had a broken leg. And he was on crutches. So he's going crutches place to place. And so they get back. I guess it went well. I, this team worked together so long and so much that they're really good at ha handling these kind of things. And so the interview went off real well and they came back. And then 10 minutes later, the director of facility shows up in our office. I said, oh, my God, we're going to get slammed again. <laughs> he said, you got the job. So one of those kind of things happens. To, you know, you just got to keep calm and cool. You know, you don't know what happened to others. But you got to be kind of, and, and the other thing, you got to be confident. And when I teach people on public speaking, I say, be confident what you're going to do. And how do you get confidence? You practice. So, and a lot of the people that go to interviews don't practice. And I'm going to say something like this, and I said, that doesn't go with me. You got to tell me what you're going to say. And I'm not off a script. You don't do a script. But if you know something well enough, you can talk through it. So, those are some of the things that you can do. Perfect. Well, we've covered a lot on today's interview. We talked about uh, keys for being able to win projects more consistently. What is business development? What is sales? One topic that kept on coming up or thing that, that you kept on repeating, which bears mentioning again, is this idea that you know selling is helping people. And especially the idea that the way that you're able to market effectively is by really understanding what someone needs, really listening to them. And how can you help our, our, our listeners understand what are some tips or techniques to make sure that you're really listening and, and not doing something else? Okay. Uh, the, the primary thing is to write everything down. You know, uh, if, you're in an inter, if you're with somebody meeting with them, I know one of my associates one day came out with a young lady who was out there. She went with her to a... Uh, interview somebody and then they got in the car and she says start writing down she says what do you mean write down write down because you'll forget it so you've got to listen intently into you know what's the next thing that's going to happen you know what should i be asking how can you ask a question if you're not listening i mean i don't know how you ask i guess you have a little group of questions you want to get answered you just go one to one but that's not what the owner wants the owner wants you to answer his question so i think you can figure out pretty quickly and as you probably see when someone's talking the other person's usually trying to figure out their next question and that's the wrong thing to do uh you just got to totally focus and your inner inner self says listen 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 you know that I don't listen that well sometimes. I get so excited about what I want to do and how I'm going to do it and all that, that I don't listen. And, you know, uh, someone says, turn here. Well, you're not listening. You, you, or, or turn left. You, you turn right. I mean, you, or you didn't hear left or you didn't hear turn. And the communication is so, and you can say things differently. I've taught communication in college too. And you can say one thing, you know, go to the house, go to the house. Go to the house. You know, the way you add emphasis makes a completely different sense. So you've got to listen so intently to how they're saying it, what they're saying, and maybe not what they're saying sometimes. And if they wink at you, you know, you got, <laughs> you got to really, but it's hard to learn somebody's style when you're meeting with them. You know, you've got to really watch. So the, the, the bottom line for this trigger is small for you need to get out there real early. You know, if you think, hey, I know that they just got another building here. They're going to have to get a new building. And, and then figure out who it is. And then in your office, the major, the major thing I always do, like it's a school system. Does anybody know anybody in the XYZ school system? Oh, yeah, my uncle's on the board. Never find that out unless you asked. Well, ask him about this. So I use everybody in marketing. We all say everybody markets. Well, there's got to be a way that you can use different people for marketing. And if they do something, let's say you make a, have a big award for them for giving you that lead and helping you with it, I mean, it, they're really proud and they'll help you some more. But I think uh, you just have to be so consistent and be out so early. Uh, and that's why if you don't have a plan, you know, if you just respond and answer to things, that just doesn't work. And you have to have that plan. It'll tell you, okay, here's the 10 people we want to work with next year. We're going to do everything we can to get to those 10 people. 
okay, Tom, you take the first two, you take out two, and we'll do a, 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 a original information, you know, gather some information, and go see and find out who you might know. But you've got to have a plan. And a small firm can make a plan. It just has to be smaller. You know, you can't do what a big firm does. And don't always think that the big firm, firm's doing a lot. They got the bureaucracy, you know, and a lot of times that really creates problems. So you're not going to have those problems, you know. Uh, next, come in next Tuesday, and he's supposed to contact these two people. He didn't do it. Well, you got that. Plus, you have two more for this week. <laughs> so there's got to be some enforcement. And I think for a marketer in this business, in my business, you have to have support at top management. You have to have it. And if you don't, what people have asked me, what do I do if I don't have that? Get the resume out and leave. Because you have to have it. You cannot. Someone's going to say, well, he's busy. He can't do that. You know, that just kills your marketing effort. So I think define what you're going to do and do it. It's, it's, you know, it's pretty simple. And don't be too over the top. You know, you don't have to market everybody all the time. Pete, how, how can people find out more about you, about what you offer, what services you offer, and where should they go to connect with you? Well, I have a uh, website, Kinley Communications. I'm in, in uh, changing it right now. But you can always get me uh, uh, through uh, uh, Pete at KinleyCommunications.com is my website and uh you can send me something and maybe they get that off of here uh but you just send me something and you know i'm in sales i answer all questions i don't someone calls me or or, or sends me something i answer I, mean, I don't have an email that doesn't get answered so and i think you'll find the same other people in marketing and sales so but i i'm, I'm open and i and, you know i'm a fellow and part of the fellows what we do is to answer people and be there whenever we can to help anyone that's part of and i know in aia your fellows are their thing is to teach and to help as much as they can and we all do the same thing perfect and that is i'll spell your last name out here it's k-i-e-n-l-e that's kenley. Correct. so kenley communications yeah Pete Kenley, thank you for being here. Uh, it's been a joy having you on the Business of Architecture podcast. Enoch, thanks for having me. I just uh, like for people to hear what I say because I have some experience that maybe they won't go down the same road I did. Perfect. Thank you. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelm and fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.